In this session, we'll be looking at symbiotic relationship between living organisms. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain symbiosis and give the different types of symbiosis. Now you'll be wondering, how is it possible that living organisms, especially some that are from the same species and some that are not from the same species, are able to associate with each other? That's what this lesson is all about, and that's what we're going to look at. So join me. What is symbiosis? This is a long-term relationship between two organisms which leads to benefits and losses. And no benefit, no losses. And no benefit and losses. So I'll explain it further with some critical examples. So we'll look at the different types of symbiosis. One is parasitism, saprophytism, amensalism, competition, and predation. So the first one we're looking at is parasitism. What is parasitism? Parasitism is a situation whereby an organism, which is known as the parasite, depends solely on the larger organism, which is known as the host. The parasite benefits, whilst the host does not benefit and loses. It loses nutrients and it can eventually die in the process. A typical example. We have tapeworm and man. The tapeworm has attachments. It has the sucker, it has the hooks, which it uses to attach itself to the intestine, the small intestine of man. Now, how does this work? The phenomenon behind this is that whenever man takes in food, the nutrients are being sucked up by the tapeworm. So instead of man to gain nutrients, it's losing nutrients. So no matter how somebody you know, no matter how somebody eats, feeds, you can finish a, a whole pot of food, but it's still looking lean because of the presence of the tapeworm. The tapeworm is the one taking all the nutrients. So that's how bad it can be. You get me? That is why WHO has advised that every individual should deworm themselves every three months. If I should ask some of you, when last did you deworm yourself? You cannot remember some decades ago. <laughs> You should please try and deworm yourself of these dangerous worms. Now, the tapeworm can be found in a cattle, and it can also be found in pigs. So we have different types of tapeworm. We have tenia solium that is found in pigs, and we have tenia seginata that is found in cattle. And you know, human beings consume both pigs and cattle. So this tendency, if it's not properly cooked, the individual can get affected by eating the eggs. And when it eats the eggs of this tapeworm, it begins to develop in the body of the host, which is the human being. The next one we're going to look at is flowering plants and mistletoe. Now, the flowering plant is well developed. The mistletoe depends on the flowering plant for support, and it also depends on the flowering plant for water and nutrients, which it uses, it uses its hyphae to get. By piercing, it could be the, by piercing the, 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 the roots of the flowering plants in order to gain these nutrients using its hyphae. But take notes, mistletoe can also produce its food. It can produce its food. The only thing that mistletoe depends on flowering plants for is the nutrients and water. You get me? So that's basically what the new, uh, mistletoe depends on flowering plants for. That's why it is known as a partial parasite. The next thing we're going to talk about is saprophytism. What is saprophytism? Saprophytism is a situation whereby animals, plants, animals such as bacteria, fungi, and fungi, yes, depend on dead, decaying organic matter for survival. We're going to look at typical examples of that. Mushroom and dead wood. The mushroom is usually found where you have dead wood. The dead wood comprises dead organic matter. So the mushroom sucks up this dead, decaying organic matter using its hyphae. It first and foremost carries out external digestion by secreting saliva to soften the wood before ingesting and taking in the contents of the dead wood. So that is mushroom or dead wood. We're going to look at another type of symbiosis, 
which is commensalism. Commensalism, what is commensalism? It is a process whereby an animal that is in attachment with another animal that is feeding gains. But the presence of the animal does not affect the one that is feeding. How am I going to put it? This is how I'm going to put it. This is how I'm going to put it. Let's say, for instance, the example of remora fish and shark. The remora fish depends solely on the food that comes out from the mouth of the shark. The pieces of food that comes out from the mouth of the shark when the shark is feeding. So what actually happens is that the remora fish moves in schools with the shark. Whatever the shark eats, the pieces, the crumbs that comes out from the, the, the mouth of the shark are being eaten by the remora fish. The remora fish gains. The shark is not gaining from the remora fish and is not affected by the presence of the remora fish. So that's basically what commensalism is basically talking about. We look at another example. The oyster and the crab. The crab depends on the oyster for protection. So in a water body, the crab gains access into the oyster. Because of the presence of the tough shell of the oyster, the crab is secured, is protected. The crab is not gaining, I mean, the oyster is not gaining anything from the crab, but it's not affected by the presence of the crab. That is another example of commensalism. We have another one, which is bacteria in the intestine of man. The bacteria is getting protection from man and is also gaining food from man. The man is not affected by this bacteria. So that is another typical example of commensalism. Now we also have another one, bacteria in the rumen of mammals. Bacteria are usually found basically in the rumen of mammals, feeding, getting protection in that part of a mammal. What is a rumen? Rumen is a, is a part, is, a, is, a, is a, a stomach part in a mammal. You know, the stomach part of a ruminant is in four chambers. We have the rumen, we have the omasum, we have the abomasum, and we have the reticulum. So the rumen is basically where the bacteria is active. Bacteria is gaining food and protection. The cow is not gaining anything from the, uh, from the bacteria, but it's not affected. Now, that is a very good relationship, isn't it? That is why some bacteria are not bad. You can see that we're not bad. We're not all bad. So don't have the mindset that all bacteria are bad and can result to death. So in this case, in this context, it's nice doing business with you, good doing business with you, bacteria, for helping me out. Breaking down food substances that are not supposed to be in the body and not affecting me in return. Yes, we're looking at the next one, which is mutualism. Mutualism is a situation whereby two organisms gain from each other positively. We're going to look at typical examples. The first one is protozoan in the intestine of termites. How does this work? The protozoan gets protection and food from the termites. How does the termite gain? The termite gains because the protozoan helps the termites to break down cellulose so that the body can digest the cellulose. So that's how the two of them gain from each other. The next one we're looking at is rhizobium leguminosarium in root noodles of leguminous plants. Now you see those bulging parts. Those are the noodles of leguminous plants. Bacteria, known as rhizobium leguminosarium, brings in atmospheric nitrogen. It fuses atmospheric nitrogen into the root noodles of these leguminous plants. And once it fuses nitrogen into the root noodles of these leguminous plants, the leguminous plant is now able to produce protein because of the presence of nitrogen. You know, that plant is deficient of nitrogen. So with the presence of this bacteria, it helps to fuse in nitrogen into the plant. So that's how the leguminous plant gains. Then the rhizobium leguminosarum, which is the bacteria, in return, gains food, carbohydrates, from the root noodles of these leguminous plants. So that's how two of them gain from each other. The next one we're looking at is lichen. Lichen is an association between fungi and algae. How does this work? The algae has food. 
for the fungi. So the fungi depends on the algae for carbohydrates, food. Whereas the algae depends on the fungi. How does, this, how does it do that? The fungi has a very long hyphae, which it can use to penetrate the roots of soils, which the algae cannot. So once it does that, the algae supplies water and soil minerals to the algae. And in return, the fungi prevents the algae from drying up. So it also serves as a form of protection for the algae. So the algae gains two things, protection and soil nutrients and water. Whereas the fungi gains food from the algae. The next one we're looking at is mycorrhizae. This is an association between flowering plants and a fungi known as mushroom. Now, how does this work? The flowering plants has roots, but yes, it has roots, but it cannot penetrate deep down into the soil. But the hyphae of the mushroom can do that. So the flowering plant depends on the mushroom to get soil nutrients and water. Whereas the mushroom depends on the roots of the flowering plant to gain carbohydrates for its feeding. So that's how two of them gain from each other. We're looking at another one. We're looking at predation. What is predation? Predation is a situation where a stronger, fierce animal devours a weaker animal. We're going to look at typical examples of that. Number one on the list is lion and goat. The goat is weak, completely weak compared to the lion. In fact, you can't keep them in the same room. That means <laughs> you want your goat to be dead. So that's how it works. Another one we're looking at is another one we're looking at is the one between hawk and chick. In the case of hawk and chick, the hawk is fiercer and stronger than the chick. The hawk has piercing claws and it has a beak that is sharp for preying on the chick. So that's the relationship between hawk and chick. The hawk lifts up the, the chicken, carries it to somewhere else where it devours it completely. We're looking at another one. We're looking at competition. Competition. This is a relationship between organisms in which they fight for a limited resource. The resource could be water. The resource could be food. The resource could be mates. The resource could be shelter. The resource could be territorial boundaries. Yes, that's, what, that's uh, uh, what competition basically is talking about. We have two types of competition. We have intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. What is intraspecific competition? Intraspecific competition is a situation whereby animals of the same species compete for a particular resource or resources. Whereas inter-specific competition is a situation whereby animals of different species compete for a particular resource or resources. We're going to look at typical examples. This is chickens in the pen. They are all of the same species. Whenever uh, a food substance or particle is dropped in their midst, they begin to struggle, struggle for that particular food resource. That is intra-specific competition. In the case of a larger adult chicken with a chick, the adult chicken doesn't care. This is where uh, the callousness of chickens comes into play. You know, apes are usually very caring. But in this case, it's a different ball game because the adult chick must feed to its food before leaving the rest for the chick. And that can eventually lead to the starvation of this chick, which can lead to death. So that's chickens in the pen. We're looking at another one. We look at lion and hyena. The lion, we know, is a very good hunter. He hunts for meat. When the lion eventually succeeds in killing his prey, the hyena now wants to compete with the lion for the prey. 
So that is a competition too. Because the lion too uh, uh, is competing with the, the hyena for the meat. So that's competition. And this is inter-specific competition. A kind of competition between species of different background, of different breed, as in species that are different. That is inter-specific competition. We look at another one. This is also inter-specific competition between a mango and grass. A mango tree and grass. The mango tree spreads its branches wide. As it spreads its branches wide, it deprives the grass under it from gaining access to the sun. And when the grass is unable to gain access to the sun, it cannot produce its food via the process of photosynthesis. And that means it's going to eventually die. So that's what it does. Another thing that the mango tree does is that it has branches. I mean, it has deeper root system compared to the grass. So it's able to gain this soil, mineral, and water easily compared to the grass. That now makes the grass to suffer. That is why when you see a mango tree, you will never see grasses under the mango tree. We now look at the next one, which is amensalism. In the case of amensalism, it's a relationship between two organisms whereby they are found in the same place. But the presence of one is having a negative effect on the other. That means the two of them are not gaining from each other. But the presence of one is having a negative effect on the other. Typical example is between the penicillium and bacteria found on bread mold. In this case, the penicillium secretes penicillin, which kills the bacteria. Hence, the origin of penicillin, the drug penicillin. We have another example, walnut tree and flowering plants. The walnut tree does not want the presence of flowering plants. They, they stay in the same abode, but they, and they don't have any effect on each other, as in no, no positive effect on each other. But the presence of one is having a negative effect on the other, and that is the walnut tree, which is also known as Joglans negricans. It secretes a poison from its roots, known as Joglones, to the roots of the flowering plants. So, when this happens, the flowering plants begins to dry up, starting from the root upwards. That's a clear indication that it doesn't want its presence there at all. So, that is amensalism. So far, we have looked at the various relationship between organisms. We have looked at the different types of symbiosis, and uh, we have gone a long way to look at the typical examples of these associations. Symbiosis is basically talking about the relationship between organisms of the same species or different species. Either they are gaining, either they are not gaining, either the presence of one is having a, a negative effect on the other. That is what symbiosis is basically talking about. Join me as we go into the session of questions and answers.